I'm Alex Grant, and this is the Law of the Case podcast for May 24th, 2024. On Tuesday, the defense rested its case in Trump's hush money trial, and the most important decisions in the case are going to be made by Judge Merchant as he puts together the jury instructions that will be read to the jury after closing arguments next week. These jury instructions have gotten, and will get, comparatively little coverage in the news media. But they are, for lawyers, the place where criminal trials are won and lost. In this episode, I will talk about a make-or-break jury instruction about Trump's state of mind, an issue that proved crucial and allowing former presidential candidate John Edwards to avoid conviction for, believe it or not, paying hush money to a woman who he was seeing outside of his marriage. That issue of Trump's state of mind is going to be crucial to the outcome, either in the trial court or on appeal. I'm Alex Grant, and I spent 23 years in the Department of Justice prosecuting nearly every type of criminal case the department handles, and I am currently an adjunct faculty member with the Western New England University School of Law. I am here to give you the straight scoop on the law, and I am unafraid to tell you when the emperor has no clothes. This podcast will cover the legal issues that journalists miss because they have never stood up in a courtroom, and I will explain the law without carrying the water for either political party. The jury instructions they were beginning to hash out Tuesday after the close of testimony are the explanation of the law by the judge for the jury. And in theory, the jury will pay close attention to the law, understand it completely, and apply the law to the facts that it finds to arrive at a verdict. In reality, The reading of jury instructions is a lengthy process. Jury instructions are dense. Every word and every phrase is important. The jury is sitting in the jury box, sometimes for over an hour, listening to these very careful, precise instructions. And frankly, it is a challenge for any human being to take all of that in and understand it. But jury instructions, even if they are not completely understood by the jury, are also important for three other big reasons. First, the jury instructions are the trial judge's decision on what the prosecution must prove. And as a result, they set the standard for the motions that the defense will file to dismiss the case on grounds that the evidence cannot support a verdict of guilty. This motion to dismiss is something that is made in every case, and it is an essential part of preserving the defendant's appellate rights. The trial judge has to look at the evidence and the law, as the judge defines it, to determine whether any reasonable jury could find for the prosecution. The second purpose for these jury instructions is that they set the boundaries for what the lawyers may argue in closing statements. The lawyers' arguments for the prosecution and for the defense are arguments about what facts should be found, but they are also arguments about how the law should be applied to those facts. So in that sense, the jury is getting taught the law by the lawyers through their arguments. The jury instructions also close off or open up what arguments the lawyers can make. So, for example, on Tuesday during the charge conference, which is what they call the hearing on the jury instructions, Judge Merchant heard again from Trump's lawyer about an advice of counsel defense. That defense basically says that a defendant who is relying upon a lawyer's advice in good faith cannot be convicted of a crime when the defendant follows that advice. Trump has been trying to assert an advice of counsel defense for months in various forms, both before the trial and during the trial. And at every stage, Judge Merchant 
has ruled that the advice of counsel defense is not warranted here. Nonetheless, Trump's lawyer was trying to advance a variant of that defense, trying to get a little toehold of that idea that Trump was acting in good faith because he was relying on lawyers or just was talking in the presence of lawyers. Again, Judge Merchant shut that down, and that will limit what Trump's lawyer is allowed to argue during closing statements. Now we come to the third purpose, and here's the other important audience for these jury instructions. Now, I suggested to you that juries might or might not fully comprehend all of the nuances of complicated jury instructions. Pellet judges, on the other hand, do understand them, and they have the time to pour over all the transcripts and to do the research to make sure that the jury instructions were correct. One of the main areas of appeal in criminal cases is a claim by the defendant that the jury was instructed incorrectly on the law. So these are high stakes for the prosecution, because if these jury instructions are not correct, then the conviction could be overturned even if the jury sides with the prosecution. In this episode, I will talk about one issue that will be addressed in these jury instructions. It has the potential to derail the prosecution before the jury or before the appellate court in the event of conviction. This issue has barely been touched since the indictment came down. So much ink has been spilled in all the writing about this case, and so much air has been expended in the discussion of this case, and yet this critical issue has barely been mentioned. As a former federal criminal prosecutor, This issue would have been at the forefront in my mind at the beginning, the middle, and the end of this case. And that issue is Trump's state of mind, or what they like to call in law school, mens rea, which is Latin for the defendant's culpable state of mind. Now, I say that this would have been at the forefront in my thinking because proving the defendant's state of mind is often the most difficult thing to prove in a white-collar case, which this false records case is. For some criminal cases, proving state of mind is hardly an issue. For example, if someone is being prosecuted for bringing a boatload of cocaine into the United States, Miami Vice style, the question of his state of mind is pretty clear, and the law does not require the prosecution to prove that the defendant knows, for example, that bringing in a boatload of cocaine is illegal. What the prosecution would have to prove in that drug case is that he possessed the cocaine in the boat and that he intended to distribute it. And with a whole boatload of cocaine, it's pretty clear that whoever owns the cocaine, the purpose is to distribute it because it would be impossible to consume all of that cocaine yourself. So that's an easy case where state of mind is not really an issue. In a white-collar case, however, the acts of the defendant are usually, in and of themselves, lawful. So think of what Trump is being accused of doing. And again, let's focus on the doing part of it before we get to his intent. Some of the key exhibits in this trial are checks and record entries. Writing out a check and making bookkeeping entries, well, those things are typically entirely lawful. And what makes them unlawful is the context and the intent and the purpose of writing those checks and making those bookkeeping entries. So you see the inherent difference between, say, the drug trafficking case I illustrated before, where the act is inherently unlawful, and a white-collar case where the act is inherently lawful and legal. So everything depends on the mental state of the defendant, the mens rea. That mens rea is different for different crimes. To take the example of homicide, most states have a manslaughter statute that requires proof of recklessness. And then a lot of states, the next step up, 
is second degree murder, where the taking of an, of life is intentional, not just reckless. And then the third step up is typically first degree murder, where there needs to be proof of premeditation, not just proof of intentionality. So you see how the degrees of those crimes correlate to greater and greater culpable mental states. So the question gets to be, what is the mens rea requirement for the particular crimes that Trump has been charged with in the hush money case? He has been charged with making or causing others to make false business records. In other words, his own business records. That's the misdemeanor offense. But he has also been charged with the felony version of that offense, which is to make or cause others to make false business records for the purpose of committing a second offense. Now, there's been a lot discussed about what exactly that other felony offense is. In fact, there's been murkiness about it ever since the case was indicted. At the time of the indictment, the district attorney's office refused to identify what the other offense was. And even as the trial has gone on, the DA's office theory about what that other offense is has shifted. And in fact, they are arguing about what that second offense is. A state election law violation, a federal election law violation, or maybe a state tax law violation. But whatever that second offense is, a campaign violation or tax violation, those crimes generally carry a heightened mens rea requirement. In what is that state of mind? Willfully. Willfully is the word that prosecutors hate to hear. Willfully is often the hardest thing to prove in criminal law. So what is willfully? Does that mean? It means that you know that you are violating the law. It means more than intentionally. Intentionally means that you are taking an action on purpose. So it is not enough in a tax case that you intentionally signed your tax return and that it was false. In a tax case, you need to know that it was false. And part of that is knowing the tax laws. That's a heavy burden for prosecutors to prove. So why does the law impose such a heavy burden in some cases, and especially white-collar cases? Well, go back to the tax return example I just gave you. Most Americans, by April 15th, file their income taxes. Sometimes they make mistakes. The tax code, both state and federal, is complicated. If it was enough that the tax return was false and that it was signed intentionally, then there would be a lot of people who could potentially be charged with criminal offenses because they did not understand the tax code. Again, imagine an ordinary homeowner trying to itemize deductions. There are rules on what deductions are appropriate and which deductions are not. This is a common process that ordinary taxpayers go through every year. And that's not to mention richer people who have much more complicated tax situations where they have investments and they have to decide things like amortization and carrying losses from one year to the next. Again, the tax code is complicated. So the courts, including the Supreme Court, for decades have decided that for certain offenses, including these tax offenses, that there would be a willfulness requirement as part of the crime. In a 1991 Supreme Court case called Cheek versus the United States held that a good faith misunderstanding of the tax code precluded a finding that the defendant acted willfully. Now, you can just imagine how hard it is to prove something like willfulness. What kind of knowledge does a defendant have inside of his or her head? One of my favorite standard jury instructions has to do with determining criminal state of mind. And it says that the defendant's state of mind can ordinarily not be determined directly, but must be determined circumstantially. In other words, it's not like we can unscrew the top of somebody's head and look inside to see what knowledge is in there. 
we need to look at a defendant's actions and their statements to infer what they know. And this is where the defendant's right to remain silent under the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution is so important. Because one logical way of sorting out what the defendant knew or didn't know about the law would be to ask him or her. So in the case of Donald Trump, okay, Trump, what did you know? What was your understanding? And we could look at that explanation and decide, okay, does that make sense? Is it that plausible? But the defendant, including Donald Trump, does not need to provide any explanation. He does not have to say anything as part of the police investigation or the court process. Some of the murkiness of the defendant's state of mind is built into the system. It's an inevitable part of the right to remain silent. So a lot is riding on this. In fact, I would suggest that the whole case probably rides on it. If you have been following the coverage of the trial at all, There has been a lot of evidence about Donald Trump having a fling with Stormy Daniels and at least one other woman. There has been evidence about a desire to keep that quiet. There's been evidence about efforts to pay money to keep that quiet during the election season. There's been testimony from Michael Cohen about Trump's personal involvement in the payment that went to Stormy Daniels. But what about his criminal state of mind? What about Trump's knowledge of the law relating to that second offense? So remember what those candidates are for that second offense. You have the campaign finance violations that are either state or federal, or you have state tax law violations. Now, the prosecution is pushing back hard against this willfully requirement. Trump's lawyers naturally want the willfully requirement. In fact, any defense lawyer who can plausibly make the argument for a willfulness instruction will push hard to include that because it is such a high burden. It is such a hard thing to prove. So where would this willfulness requirement come from in this case? Now, if you look at the indictment, there are 32 counts that are essentially the same thing in the sense of the alleged crime and the alleged elements of those crimes. It's basically the falsification of Trump's business records relating to the payment to Michael Cohen that the prosecutors say is a cover for an actual payment by Trump to Stormy Daniels to keep her quiet during the election season. The language of the indictment is what determines the elements of these offenses and ultimately the jury instructions. So in other words, the prosecution, by deciding what crimes to present to the grand jury for indictment, is deciding what elements it must prove at trial and what goes into these jury instructions. The first part of each of these 32 counts is that the defendant, with the intent to defraud, made or caused a false entry in the business records of an enterprise that enterprise being the Trump Organization. That part I just read is the misdemeanor. The part that makes it a felony is this additional allegation that the defendant did so, made these false records, with, quote, the intent to commit another crime and aid and conceal the commission thereof, end quote. Now, I just want to caution you for a minute You heard the word and, so it might sound like the prosecution has to prove an intent to commit another crime and to prove he had the intent to aid and the intent to conceal the commission of the crime. But it is an arcane part of the law that says that those ands turn into ors when you come to translate the indictment into a jury instruction. So let's go over that again. The prosecution has to prove that the defendant made a false entry in the books and records with the intent to defraud. That's the misdemeanor. And then also prove, did the defendant have the intent to commit another crime or the intent to aid or the intent to conceal the commission of that second crime? It's this language of intent to commit another crime or the intent to aid or conceal the other crime that brings us to willfully. 
Now, notice the word willfully is not part of the indictment. However, courts consistently read willfully into the elements of the crime where the offense requires that the defendant had to know that he was violating the law. So the question here is, does the statute require that? And I think it does. This statute bumps a misdemeanor up to a felony based on this intent element. Now, and again, keep in mind that the prosecution already has to prove intent to defraud just to get to the misdemeanor. This intent to commit another crime is the second intent that the prosecution has to prove. And this is not meant to be a little speed bump for the prosecution. This is meant to be a significant hurdle. It is meant to meaningfully distinguish the misdemeanor, which has fewer consequences in terms of your record, potential collateral consequences like voting, collateral consequences for immigration. This intent element is meant to distinguish more serious crimes from less serious crimes. Now, as a bunch of legal analysts have pointed out, this intent element does not require that the second offense be carried out. The prosecution does not have to prove that the second offense was completed. And keep in mind that the prosecution chose not to charge these second offenses. And the fact that the DA's office has been squirrely in shifting around about what exactly the second offense is, or maybe there's more than one second offense, that tells you that they did not want to take on the task of proving that he actually committed the second offense. So they lighten their load by keeping to the business record charges. But how much did they lighten their load? I'm not sure they lightened it very much. So how can Trump intend to commit another crime or to conceal another crime unless he knows what that cr second crime is? So in other words, Trump may have had the intent to carry out the actions that would violate campaign finance laws or tax laws. But if he did not know that those actions would violate those laws or any laws, because he's not versed in all of the particulars of those laws, how can it be said that he intended to commit another crime? Ever since this indictment came down last year, I have been reading a ton about this case and all of the reputable traditional media organizations like the New York Times, the Washington Post, reputable podcasts, and nobody has really hit upon this critical mens rea element. This element was so important in another case from over 10 years ago. You may recall it. Former presidential candidate John Edwards was charged with a federal campaign finance violation for arranging $925,000 to be paid to a woman with whom he had an affair and with whom he fathered a child. This was hush money. The theory of that case was that the $925,000 was a contribution to Edwards' campaign. Now, that makes sense because Edwards was certainly motivated at the time the money was paid to conceal the relationship because he was in the middle of a presidential campaign. And that news would have hurt him politically. And of course, if someone is paying hush money, it's quite unlikely that they're going to disclose that contribution. I suppose Edwards could have avoided the indictment against him just like Trump could have avoided the indictment against him had Edwards made a disclosure with election officials about this hush money contribution and admitted that the contribution was made to his campaign or, in the Trump case, admitted that it was made to the Trump campaign. But that would have defeated the whole point of the hush money, which was to keep the alleged affair. In both Edwards' case and in Trump's case, a secret. When that case, and meaning the Edwards case, was charged, I was with the Department of Justice, and I had no involvement in it, but I remember thinking, based on what I had read in the newspapers, that this seemed like a pretty sound theory of prosecution, pretty understandable. And on the point of Edwards' knowledge of the law, well, Edwards was an attorney, a very successful attorney someone 
who is actually angling for the position of attorney general in the Obama administration. So it seemed that John Edwards would be hard pressed to claim ignorance of the law. But that's exactly what he and his lawyers did. And at the trial, the jury acquitted him of one count and hung on the rest of the counts. So you have the Edwards hush money case that resulted in an acquittal and a hung jury. And the Department of Justice deciding not to pursue the case any further on the deadlock counts. Here's what Politico had to say about the case in 2012 in a piece that explained how the Edwards case failed. Quote, Another problem that may have tripped up prosecutors, proving that Edwards knew his alleged actions were illegal, something the government must show to get a conviction in a campaign finance case. And here's what Edwards' lawyers said shortly after the decision was made not to retry him on the deadlock counts. So this is Edwards' lawyers out of doing a victory dance. Quote, While John has repeatedly admitted to his sins, he has also consistently asserted, as we demonstrated at the trial, that he did not violate any campaign law, nor even imagine that any campaign laws could apply, end quote. That's the last part. That was the ignorance of law defense that they raised successfully. He could never have imagined that any campaign laws could apply. Now, after the indictment came down last year in the Trump case, the Washington Post did a podcast on the charges and actually made the comparison to the Edwards case. And the takeaway for the Justice Department prosecutors from that is that if you try to prove a crime out of hush money payments on facts like these, you know, an alleged affair from years ago, it is very hard to convince a jury that that was done as a campaign expense as opposed to to protect the person's marriage, to protect the person's reputation. Uh, for pr essentially private reasons. But notice that in framing the case and making the comparison between the Trump indictment and the Edwards case, that the reporter is framing the burden of proof as showing that Trump had a campaign or political purpose to hu pay the hush money versus a private reason, i.e. to keep it from his wife, Melania. That does not quite capture the burden of proof. As I said, it's not enough to show that Trump had a campaign purpose or a political purpose. This false record statute says he had to have the intent to commit this second offense. In other words, the campaign fa finance violation. So to my mind, what the district attorney's has office has done is taken on the task of proving in the Trump case what they were unable to prove in the Edwards case. In other words, that Trump had the intent to commit this campaign finance crime, which includes proving that he understood that he was violating the law. And you would think that if the prosecution had trouble proving that John Edwards, the lawyer, John Edwards, the attorney general prospect, did not understand campaign finance law, then it would be even harder to prove that Donald Trump, businessman, would understand campaign finance law and that he would understand that he was violating campaign finance laws by arranging for this hush money payment. So in this podcast, the Washington Post came close to hitting the nail on the head, but not quite. What I think comes closest is some analysis done by David French and Sarah Isger just recently in their podcast, advisory opinions. So to get it to a felony, you have to prove that the falsified business records, which again, let's just presume for the sake of argument that's proven, was falsified with the intent to defraud that included an intent to commit another crime or to aid or conceal the commission of thereof. The only other crime that truly, in my view, makes sense in that category is the election crime. But the election crime was not charged by the feds. I don't see evidence that there was an intent to cover up a state tax crime or an intent 
to cover up another state financial crime, what I see is potentially evidence that the state, the falsification of business records had the effect of committing another crime that was not charged, but not that it had the intent of committing the other crime. Does that make sense? It does. I don't think they need to prove that Trump like looked up the statute and was like, aha, there's this tax thing I don't want to do. Now, again, I don't think they quite hit the nail on the head, but they're pretty close. They are beginning to convey this sense that an intent to commit another crime also, by necessity, includes an intent that you know that you're committing another crime. They don't. But what they don't do is tap into this long line of case law, this longstanding legal doctrine about willfulness, which is what the federal prosecutors in the Edwards case had to prove. So as I say, the district attorney's office did lighten its load just a bit by not having to prove the completed campaign finance offense because the prosecutors do not have to prove the actions that prove the campaign finance law violation. But they have not relieved themselves of the obligation to prove essentially the same state of mind that they would have had to prove if they had charged the campaign finance offenses. Now, this analysis might suggest to you that this case is kind of iffy at best, meaning the whole case against Trump is iffy at best, at least when it comes to proving the felony, which is not what you've heard from nearly every reputable media source. The conservative media sources, on the other hand, hate the case and claim that it is politically motivated, but they don't zero in on this willfulness problem. Why? Well, it sounds kind of technical. I imagine as a political matter, the more compelling narrative is the one that Trump has been promoting, which is that all the Democrats are out to get him rather than the precise and effective argument that John Edwards' lawyers made on his behalf about his ignorance of campaign finance law. I think this statute should, and probably will, if not in the trial court, then in an appellate court in the event of conviction, be interpreted to require that as part of that intent element to commit the second crime, that the defendant has to know what that second crime is or that it is even a crime. And what that means is that the prosecution has to prove willfulness, knowledge that the conduct that you're engaging in violates the law. And that literally means understanding in the case of tax law or in the case of campaign finance law or in the case of something like healthcare fraud law, what certain regulations require. And not many people understand those regulations. Not many people at all. Maybe Donald Trump does, especially tax laws. He seems quite intent on taking advantage of tax laws or loopholes that work to his advantage, which is perfectly fine. But that does imply a certain level of knowledge about tax laws. On the other hand, Trump could argue that he leaves that tax law business to other people. But the bigger point is that this trial hasn't really been about that. It hasn't been about what did Trump know about campaign finance laws? What did Trump know about the tax code and how business expenses are categorized and how that impacts your tax bill? The trial hasn't been about that. And in the event of a conviction, an appellate court, having decided that knowledge of the law is part of that intent element, An appellate court will be scouring the record, meaning the transcripts of the testimony and all of the exhibits, to look for evidence of what Donald Trump knew about those second offenses in a legal sense. And that is not a place that the prosecution wants to be. Now, the initial reports I have seen have indicated that Judge Merchant, the trial judge, in the charging conference, seem to indicate that willfulness was too high a standard to hold the prosecution to. I just have trouble understanding what the intent to commit another crime element consists of if it doesn't include this knowledge of the law element that I've been talking about. Clearly, the statute is adding something that the prosecution must prove. 
And again, it's bumping it from the misdemeanor to a felony. So if it doesn't mean that you do not intend to break the law, then what does it mean? What more about Donald Trump's mental state is the prosecution having to prove? What the prosecution is probably saying, and I'm saying probably because their proposed jury instructions have not been made public, is that they need to prove that Donald Trump intended to do the acts that constituted the second offense. But the problem with that reading is that the statute does not require that the second offense be completed. The statute does not require that the defendant took any acts in furtherance of the second offense other than the falsified business record. So the prosecution would like to just have to prove that Donald Trump intended the act of falsifying the business record, but that's what you need to prove to prove the misdemeanor. So you come back to the problem of what exactly is this intent to commit another crime adding? I think it has to mean what the words naturally say, which is that the defendant has to have some kind of specific intent to violate the second offense, whatever that second offense is, the tax law violation or the campaign finance law violation. The prosecution has been arguing in court and this was the central theme of their opening statement, that Trump's purpose in paying the hush money was election interference or influencing the election. They may be arguing that proving an intent to influence the election is sufficient. Now, I got to tell you, that does not make much sense to me because the statute talks about an intent to commit another crime. And influencing an election in and of itself is not illegal. Everything that every candidate and every supporter says or does during the campaign is intended to influence the election. Even making false statements in support of influencing the outcome of an election is not illegal. If it were, we would probably have charges against nearly every candidate who runs for office. And if the statute were somehow construed to criminalize the making of false statements to influence an election, the statute would inevitably run afoul of the First Amendment, which gives great latitude to political speech. And the Supreme Court has even held that lies can often be protected speech. So I don't think the prosecution is going to get away with just proving that the false business records were made with the intent to influence the election. I will wrap up by playing a clip from an interview from last year, just as the Trump hush money indictment was coming down. NPR had Cyrus Vance, the predecessor to Alvin Bragg as the Manhattan District Attorney, in for an interview. And perhaps the juiciest part was when they asked Vance why he did not pursue the hush money case, presumably with much the same information that Bragg had. What were Vance's hesitations? What were his concerns? So here's what he had to say. You were asked to, you know, we were asked because the federal prosecutors were looking at it. Uh, they had better laws. So up until Michael Cohen pleaded guilty, uh, then this was really something that, uh, that, that the federal government had asked that we not get involved with. But, you know, and also I think it's, I think it's well known that there are, you know, that as a matter of New York law, unlike federal law, there are novel issues uh, around using uh, the false statements statute in connection with committing a crime that violates federal election laws. Uh, there's no surprise there or secret there. So there were a number of reasons uh, that caused us to, um, to, to think carefully. Notice that he mentions that the federal prosecutors had better laws and the federal prosecutors with the better laws declined to prosecute Trump for the Stormy Daniels payment. Vance cited a different issue than the one I've been analyzing, which is, can the New York false record statute pick up a federal statute as the second offense? But it does go to show you that some smart people hesitated and ultimately decided not to bring this case that is about to be decided by the jury. This question about willfulness and the burden to prove Trump's mental state is a big, big decision. And as I mentioned, with respect to the Edwards case, 
the question of willfulness is what allowed Edwards to mount a successful defense to the charges against him. This may sound like a technical issue or a technical defense, but proving mental state is what criminal prosecutions are all about. I just hope that Judge Merchant gets this right, because the repercussions for the country of a guilty verdict, followed by a successful appeal, would be so far-reaching and so negative that we would want to avoid them at all costs. But that question is the topic for an upcoming podcast. Stay tuned. And that's it for this week's episode of the Law of the Case podcast. I'm Alex Grant, and we are on YouTube, Spotify, many other podcast apps. We are on Twitter. We are on Facebook. And if you would like to email the show, you can email me at lawofthecase at gmail.com. Until next time, this is the Law of the Case podcast.